we didn't want to release a product just to make cash and fund our Quad Cortex project. We always have cared about the quality of sound of our products and also the user experience in general, how the usability of our products have been always a top priority. Welcome to Bobby Osinski's Inner Circle. I'm Bobby Osinski, and this is a show all about music, music production, and the music business. My guests this week are the co-founders of Neural DSP, Doug Castro and Francisco Cresp. Neural DSP manufactures the highly regarded Quad Cortex amplifier modeler, as well as a line of modeling plugins. Even though Neural DSP is located in Finland, both Doug and Francisco are actually from Chalet, both fell in love with the country and its music as high school exchange students who decided to relocate to Finland after school. After Doug developed the dark glass bass pedals, which he eventually sold to Korg, Neural DSP is created with the idea of developing state-of-the-art amplifier simulator tools. During the interview, we got deep into how Quad Cortex was created, Doug's backstory with dark glass bass pedals, how plugins were an integral part of the company's strategy, their reference amps and speakers, and much more. I spoke with Doug and Francisco via Zoom from their offices in Helsinki, Finland. First of all, I know that you guys have a very interesting background because you're not from Finland. And everybody would think that you were. As a matter of fact, I was talking to a friend, a, a Cortex user yesterday, who was saying, oh, yeah, those guys from Finland. <laughs> So I know you're based there, but that's not where you're originally from. So give me the backstory on that. Yeah, basically, uh, both of us were exchanging students in Finland when we were teenagers in, in different years. Uh, we both came around 17, 18 years old as an exchange program year to study in a, in a high school, basically, just because we were both very curious about Finland's culture and how many bands they had, you know, touring around the world. And, and we, we are from Chile originally, and, and Chile doesn't have much of too many bands touring the world like the latin market is big but the world market is a little bit small so we were wondering what was going on in finland and, and the exchange program was the opportunity for us so young to go and see what was going on in that country right yeah so like then after we we both went back to chile these are two separate stories that it are it's very funny because they're they're the same <laughs> uh, we both did the same thing in different years and then we met in chile because of that reason we had a friend in common that you know, introduced us and, and he said like, Hey, you, you both have been in Finland. You both love that place. You both have been exchange students there. You can stop talking about it. So you should probably meet. <laughs> so yeah, like that's, that's how we became friends in the first place. And then, you know, we, we moved to Finland later on. Doug moved first to start his company, Darkless Electronics. He had a previous company that they, they made bass pedals. You probably know it. And when I moved in uh, to Finland later, a couple, couple of years later, maybe five, six years later, started working with a friend first. And then, you know, we started contacting again with Doug and, and started working together in Darkness first. And that's how it all started with Neural from there. We had an idea and then we started a new company together. Yeah, yeah. No, that's interesting. I'm, uh, it's funny how sometimes people with similar interests come together and they come together in, in an unusual way. So I'm. Um, that's a great story, Doug. Yes. So you move you moved to Finland and then you started your company, right? Yeah, correct. I, I started working on the. Actually, I have a darkness pedal here. I was just getting that. Uh, I'm yeah. still. Uh, we sold it to Korg a couple of years ago, but I'm still in really good terms with them and, and hang out with them and, and everything. So, yeah, I started working on the first darkness. I'm a bass player. You can see a bass there in the back. I was trying some some new stuff. Yeah, I've always been very passionate about playing bass guitar since I was 13. You know, so now. Uh, what 23 years 24 years you know being in chile the access to equipment is very limited uh also you know broke college student back then i didn't have much money of studying electronics and the idea actually was to study electronics so i could you know work on my own amplifiers and, and i just always loved tinkering and, and creating things uh and yeah i ended up falling in love with engineering as much or more than you know playing bass and in college i started working on my own distortion pedals and amplifiers for bass and that later became uh, Douglas. And I moved in 2009 to Finland, moved back, you know, as Francisco said, we both fell in love with the culture and the place. So the moment I returned to Chile to finish high school and then go to, to school after that, uh, my whole obsession was finding a way to come back to Finland. So, uh, yeah, once I had the first Douglas products engineered, uh, I moved here and yeah, in 2010, 11 launched Douglas, you know, officially and, and, 
I think it was maybe around three, four years later, 2014 or 15, Francisco, you, you moved here. Uh, and back then, Douglas was very small. It was, you know, maybe four or five people. I was doing all the engineering and also was the only musician <laughs> in the company that the rest of the people were, I mean, we had like all the people playing music, but they, they weren't in Helsinki. So I needed somebody with really good ears to help me do quality assurance because I was engineering everything. And then, you know, we had a small crew of three, four people that were building the products, but all the quality assurance then fell, you know, fell back on me. And yeah, um, I know Francisco was a, a really, really good producer and also, you know, world-class musician. So I knew he'd have more than good enough ears to tell, you know, if this compressor is, you know, acting a bit wonky or, or you know, this distortion pedal has a bit too much high end or whatever, right? So, and yeah, I needed a lot of help with that. And I think very shortly, the Marcus, who's now the CEO, sort of made you his right-hand man in, in the factory because he was very smart and had lots of ideas and, and I think maybe after a couple of years, Francisco told me that he wanted to work in R&D, helping with designing, like coming up with new products and everything. And around that time, I started dreaming about the concept of the quad cortex. This is, you know, 2016, 17. And Francisco at the same time wanted to do plugins because, you know, he's a producer. So he was always very active with plugins and I was all analog, you know, hardware guy. And then, yeah, we sort of decided that probably both ideas were really good in combination, but also outside the scope of Darkless. Darkless being a base company, we thought it'd be quite limited to base, right? And, and we knew that if you wanted to make really good plugins on something like the Quad Cortex, the market for that could be vastly bigger, right? Could be guitars, which, you know, right off the bat is 10 times bigger than the base market. And of course, with software, you can do a lot of other cool things. So why limit ourselves to such a small niche? And that's how, you know, the, the idea of spinning this off from, from Darkless into a new entity happened. And this was in 2017, 2018. So in 2017, you realized that you needed machine learning expertise to do what you needed to do, which was ahead of the curve in the music business anyway. So how did, did, you, did you go back to school for that? Did you hire somebody to, to help you? How did that work? No, I mean, I, my, my background was purely on, on the analog side of things. And, and even today I have like, you know, a rudimentary understanding of how these things work, but, but not nearly good enough to implement any of this. Now we have a world-class team of a, a team with a lot of, you know, really brilliant people who's, you know, who live and breathe these different technologies. In the case of machine learning, we we're very fortunate that our local university, Alto University, they have a really, 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 you know, world-class acoustics program. And a lot of these people are really passionate about DSP. Sort of the machine learning department is sort of like in the building next door. So a lot of the people from the machine learning side of things that also love music, were collaborating with the acoustics people. So yeah, there was lot, lots of uh, sort of organic cooperation between, you know, we're talking master and PhD students, you know, 25, 26-year-old kids who were pioneering a lot of these technologies in around the same time. And we're very fortunate to connect with them, sold them on the idea of, of the vision we had, and, and we're fortunate enough that they were, you know, uh, adventurous enough to to join us. We were really lucky with, you know, the first the first few hires. I mean, we'll be very fortunate even later on, but but... Uh, out of the bat, without a name or anything to attract such talent very early on was a very, very, it's one of the lucky breaks you need to, you, you talk about, it, right? It's not all, you know, it's not all execution and merit. There's, there's a lot of, you know, hard work and, and dedication, but there's also always an element of good fortune there. For sure. Yes. Okay. So Francisco, you wanted to get into plugins. Was that one of the things that you did right off with Neural, go right into plugins or did that come along later? Yeah, so basically what, what I wanted to do was to first do a darkless uh, version, like a, a darkless pedal software version, because like darkless electronics was really well known for, for their sound and a lot of bass players wanted, I, I know a lot of producer friends that they would like to have this sound in a software platform. And there were other companies that were emulating, you know, darkless pedals in, in their own platforms under a different name, right? So it was a very safe bet to start with because like we knew that there was demand for the, for the product. And then it was my chance to, you know, take a take a leap of faith in what a good user interface for me is, and what you know, take a leap of faith on on how a good uh, sounding digital analog uh, digital emulation of an analog pedal would be. Also for bass, was like uh, a little bit interesting that it, it wasn't like guitar or something for production or compressor or anything like that. So um, I didn't see, aside from like you know, everybody who had been using until then the Sansamp plugin in Pro Tools, for example, great plugin as well. But there was not so much offering as well. So we saw, I saw like a, a bit of a need there. 
And of course, the schematics were owned by Doug. So it was a little bit easier to start with that one and all the designs and we could get the license for an official product. And it, it seemed like a very solid start. So basically, I just went online and spent hours researching how what type of profile of people I would need to hire. We set up a budget and, you know, I hired the first two programmers, one UI designer and implementation and a DSP engineer, and we got it rolling. And luckily it went well. Then we built a website and we started selling that and it, it, it we started generating some cash. So it's like a very interesting time. But yeah, it was basically plugins right off the bat and quickly, quickly the need for like we, we, we wanted to venture into, into the guitar market because we already had this idea for the, for the core cortex and we knew that that was the market we wanted to reach. So then the, that idea expanded into, you know, more complex cabinets, more complex uh, guitar amplifiers and all the machine learning technology that we started developing after that. But yeah, it was basically plugins right off the bat. This was a deliberate decision. Um, was that if you think of a product like the Quad Cortex, you know, you have a lot of hardware engineer, mechanical engineer manufacturing, which is, you know, very slow and expensive and difficult to make. And then you have a lot of DSP work, right? Like you need to model all these amplifiers and effects and everything. So it is like a huge, you know, like gargantuan amount of, of, of work. Uh, and we thought, you know, applying is basically like you can make applying with like one or two percent of the DSP work minus all the hardware manufacturing. You just put a beautiful user interface. And every, of course, it's very complicated in, in, in its own right, but the amount of work needed is much lower. So we thought we can start capitalizing on, on the R&D we need to do for the Quad Cortex anyway through plugins earlier on, which, you know, would help us generate revenue, of course, so we can reinvest that and hire more people and then, you know, accelerate the Quad Cortex and all the research projects. Uh, but also we can start building a brand and a name for ourselves so that when the Quad Cortex is ready, we're already somewhat established and, you know, we're not just, just coming out of the blue with this, you know, really strange product. So, uh, and this is one of the things that we're, we're surprised that it worked actually, because when you come up with plans like this, you know, there's sort of multi-pronged plan, you know, one thing goes wrong and the whole thing falls apart. So it, it it's always fascinating when, you know, you have these hundreds of little things that need to happen in perfect sequence and, and, you know, it, it all kind of comes together at the end. It did take a lot longer than we thought it would, and it cost a lot more money than it, than we thought it would. If you would have known, I don't think we would have done it because it would, when we found out how difficult and expensive it, it'd be, we're already too invested in it. So we just had to kind of like see it through. The decision of sort of starting with plugins was, was key to, you know, to build the company, build, build, build the brand, build a solid reputation for making really good sounding digital products for musicians and then leverage all of that whenever the quad cortex would be ready. Just out of curiosity. What is the most expensive part of developing that? Is it the manpower? Yeah, for sure. I mean, at, at the peak of the Quad Cortex, we were, and you know, we're then, this is where a two, three year old company, we might have had 50, like five zero engineers working on the Quad Cortex at, at any given time. For audio companies, it's, it's a lot of people actually. Uh, and you know, it, it is, you have to bankroll that for, you know, for years, right? So, so yeah, it, it it was very, very, very expensive. But yeah, the manpower was by far the the most expensive part. Okay, so since both of you guys are players, I assume that you took a leading role in actually trying the product as it was being developed. What was your criteria for? Oh, I think we got it. Yeah. So basically, it needs to sound the same. It's like on a blind test, you shouldn't be able to tell, and that was like always the standard. And it was a bit more tricky with, with the dark class pedal was like a little bit easier to reach that point because we had all the schematics and there's like many tools in the digital domain that allows you, allow you to, you know, get into the intricacies of the circuit and try to get it right. And, and back then we were just starting our machine learning technology. So it was sort of a different approach. And then when we started to get into, into the tube amplifiers for guitar, then like I was always really unhappy personally with, with other products that were out there I, 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 until then i've been you know making music for my own passion until you know until we started the company i was always quite unhappy with the quality of of you know guitar modeling software and there was this narrative online of like digital products being inferior to the tube amplifiers relatives right so I, I always got me really curious of what was it? Like, how is it possible that we're so advanced in, in digital technologies in, in so many other fields, you know, like photography and video and, you know, many other arts that have, you know, evolved or computers in general are super powerful nowadays. So that curiosity, I think that pushed the limits of the engineers as well to, you know, try to challenge them into getting this precision level a step forward. 
and new techniques were were coming out. And as as we explained to you, we also met these really talented young kids from university that had plenty of ideas on how to solve those problems. And then we were really happy to the point that we were comparing with the tube amplifier and in a blind test, none of the people at the company, which many, many of us have very good ears, we, we couldn't tell the difference between like the real thing and the digital counterpart. So that was, that was the point that we were like, okay, we, we are definitely up to something. And then we were, when we would compare versus the competition, it would be like, yeah, ours is definitely better. It took time to get there, uh, but I believed in our product like 150%. And I think that paid off. Like we didn't, we didn't want to release a product just to make cash and, you know, fund our quad quarters project, but it was, we always have cared about the quality of, of sound of our products and also the user experience in general, how, the usability of our products have been always a, a top priority. So I think those two combined have placed the, the name of the of the company out there. Okay, that's a good place to go to. So for a brand new Quad Cortex owner, what's the best way to learn the pedal? Because it can be deep. One of the reasons was why we also started this path of, of creating this this Quad, Quad Cortex platform, this multi-FX platform, was that the, whatever was out there as well was really difficult to use. Like it, it Sometimes it was really difficult to use and it sounded great or it didn't sound as good and it was very easy to use. But there was nothing that we found that had, you know, the, the audio precision that, that we wanted and the ease of use that we wanted. So we shuffled a lot of ideas and it's like, how, the, how, how can no one has like done something simpler with a touchscreen? Everybody knows how to use a, a, a phone, right? Like by then iPhones were already a big thing, right? So we started working with like very talented UI user interface. Uh, designers that we hired as well. We, we also got lucky there, like really talented people, uh, really passionate people. And we started solving these problems bit by bit. We tried several approaches, but mostly it, re- it comes down to, to answer your question, it comes down to simplicity, ease of use, and, uh, and sound quality, portability, and many, like many connections. So for somebody that, that is starting, the Quad Cortex is a very friendly platform because if you have ever used the phone, it's really simple to build your signal chain. It's just, there's a plus, you tap here, select something from the library, and that's it. There's no, there's not so many different things that you have to learn on the learning curve. It's really, it's really mild compared to competition products. It's a very complex platform if you want it to be, but it doesn't have to be. And I think that that's the appealing part for many musicians that don't need very complicated signal chains. They are very happy with an amplifier, a cabinet, and a little bit of reverb. They can do that in, two seconds and, and that's not a problem so for someone that is starting it's it's a really friendly user interface which we're we're really proud of okay here's one for both of you so when you're first developing quad cortex what was the amplifier at guitar and bass amplifier amplifiers that were, you were using as your reference point uh, for me it was all bass so of course all the darkless pedals were a big part of my sound uh, obviously uh, but then, you know, the classics, like big fan of Ampeg, Mesa Boogie, High Watt, um, you know, that, that's, that's about it. And, and compression as well. But yeah, um, with bases, you know, the, the, you have so many options. So, you know, uh, I've couple amps and, and a few pedals and, and you're, you're good. I think for you, Francisco, probably the, the answer is more. Well, we yeah, just, I think like in, in, as, as I was mentioning, we had to create this big library, right? So in the end, it, it uh, because we were developing these plugins at the same time. And sometimes, uh, for example, the, the second plugin that we made was with Pliny, like for, for guitar, right? And he demanded some, some gear that he uses all the time. So we were forced to, you know, research some things first than others. And then we recycled that part as a, as, as part of the library for Code Cortex. So more than just one reference, it, w- it was trying to start completing that library bit by bit uh, without losing that accuracy because when you have to do so many things at the same time, we have to do hundreds of amplifiers. It's very easy to say, okay, this is good enough and let's go. But we were very careful into releasing product by product. We were doing parts of the library at the same uh, at, at the time, but then people didn't know that we had the quad cortex on the on the oven at the uh, at the time, right? It was like a hidden hidden project. So that allowed us to to not lose accuracy while still generating some uh, products to sell that that did very well, uh, but there was not exactly just just one reference. But as as Doug said, like you know, Marshall amps and Ampegs and Mesa movies, all the classics. We we love tube amps. We're all gearheads, so 
everything was a good reference, to be honest. Yes, but you own your own amplifiers, and I'm sure that that's what you use because you knew them the best. So I'm just curious, what were they? Oh, yeah. I, I have a, the 5150 for me is like the, the first 5150 is like a really good reference to me. And, and I just say 800 has always been one of like those are my two favorite amps. 5153 is also really good. Like I love high gain amps, but for low gain stuff, I, I like, uh, Marshall the JM800 is just so, such a versatile amp, to be honest. You can, you can do so much with it. You just put a pedal before that if you want more gain or just like lo- use low output pickups. And then you have a very clean edge of breakup type of sound. Those were for me the two references. I, I have them right there. Um, but yeah, I, I just aim at 5151 would be the, my two picks. Amplifiers, the electronics are one thing. But the speaker cabinets are another. And as you know, guitar players tend to change speaker cabinets a lot. So how did you go about deciding what to model there? Because there's so many more variations there, I would think. Yeah. So we have the we have the luck to know a lot of people that are really passionate as we are in different different fields. We have a very good friend, um, Adam, more more well known as Nolly. We have a product with him as well. He was the bass player of Very Free. And he's a very good producer and he collects speakers and he's like a very nerd into the speaker world and he has researched like some good ways of doing IRs and like he has done thousands and thousands of IRs with different methods. Like he has put foam in places, take lifted the cap, turn the cap upside down. It's like shoot with the screws, without the screws, you know, where the cables go in the speaker, if you turn them around or put the microphone in the different places, he's done all these experiments. So. When we started working with him, the results were really good. And, and basically we told him like, Hey, we need a library. Would you be uh, willing to work with us on a, on a big library for, for the quad cortex? And he said, yes. So basically we just bought a big library from him. And, um, yeah, that, that was a really big help because he had all the speakers. And if he didn't have them, he knew exactly how to hunt them in eBay. And, you know, he's a collector. So he went the extra mile to, to get us what we needed for the library. That's another lucky break for you. Oh yeah, indeed. <laughs> There's a lot, and, and and actually, I think another lucky break we had was luckily through Douglas, I had become friends with a lot of the people that we work with. Pliny, for example, was a a good friend of mine before we even worked together. Before nearly even existed, we would you know chat on on Facebook and talk about music and stuff. And and uh, Mike Fordin as well for uh, Fordin amplification. Uh, we met at Nam, and he wanted to collaborate with Douglas on a on a completely separate project. Um, and we were talking about that actually, and and. All of a sudden, I told him, would you like to do a plugin of one of your amplifiers? So, you know, we can I explain what the business end of things would look like. I was like, yeah, sure, why not? And, you know, that became the 40 Nameless, which, you know, put us on the map pretty much. We're quite niche, still doing the Darkless stuff, which, you know, did really well for our first product. We were very happy with it. But when the 40 Nameless came out, I think we, we both realized, like, oh, yeah, like, like this is going to be huge. Like, until then, we had all these dreams and aspirations, but it felt really uncertain. Um, and when the Nameless came out, it just, you know kind of took the community by storm and, and things got really crazy really quickly. Uh, and that definitely enabled us to do everything we've done since. So, And I think with Francisco and I have put a great effort also into cultivating these relationships. And for me, one of the most rewarding things about working in, in, in this industry and doing the work we do, of course, you know, having a dream of, you know, a product that you would love to have yourself and then work with amazing people to make it happen. It, it's It's in itself, you know, a dream come true. But another great privilege that people maybe don't talk so much about is the relationships you build along the way. Like you force these incredible friendships and partnerships with super cool, creative people that are doing all sorts of amazing things. And that's definitely helped us a lot to, you know, do well and grow uh, because, you know, we sort of for decades sometimes, you know, build, build these relationships with people. So that's been a definitely a lucky break, but also th- there's a lot of effort, you know, you put into maintaining these relationships and making sure that you, you're there to help people without expecting anything in return necessarily and, and try to come up with good deals with artists, for example, you know, something that feels well balanced where they feel like they're, you know, getting paid their, their first share and everything. So, um, yeah, it's something that we definitely put a lot of, uh, a lot of value and emphasis on as part of our work. Doug, you mentioned just before about NAM, but you guys didn't display there for the last one. How come? Well, we had the huge soon time uh <laughs> yeah no we, we're experimenting with different things so with them the year before we did 
we had this huge, huge booth. Uh, I think we had probably the biggest booth that show because a lot of the, the big guys, Fender Gibson, didn't didn't exhibit. So uh, we're like the the we had a massive booth which cost you know a lot of money. And one thing we wanted to try actually, what would happen if we and we already rented the big space, thinking about the big booth, and we decided to try what if we actually just do like a little PR stunt, basically have the huge sign, just you know have people guessing. Uh, and then just have a small office in which we could, you know, our sales and marketing people could still talk to press and, and key accounts, you know, dealers, distributors. Um, and we didn't notice any, any, any big sort of difference in, in the figures at the end of the month, right? Uh, but it's still cool to, to display things and to interact with people. So, uh, next year we're still sort of discussing what we'll do, but we might do something in the middle, not, not like this huge, you know, I don't know, like ego boosting <laughs> booth for us. <laughs> But still something cool where people can, you know, hang out and come check, you know, what's new and everything and, and you know, talk, talk with us, take pictures and everything. But also they get a lot of the space so that our sales and marketing people can do the work you're there to do, right? Like you're there to, you know, show new stuff to distributors, dealers, build those those, those relationships as well. So I think we'll prioritize space for the for for that side of the of the business to be comfortable and do well. And then just li- leave a little space also for, you know, for people that work around the show to try what's new and, and hang out. Okay, I have a question for both of you. This actually comes from one of my oldest friends, who's a uh, session bass player here in Los Angeles. And he's done work for Pink and Alicia Keys and Courtney Love and whatever. But he's a big quad cortex user, and that's his main rig. No, that's all them. But he, he asked me to ask you about bass and guitar synthesis. Because apparently you can't make it work for some reason. So whoa. I'm a big fan of synthesizers. Like I, I have many synthesizers. Probably, probably too many. But yeah, I'm a big fan of them. And I've always tried to because I, I really can't play the keys, and that's a big challenge for me. So I usually just end up in the piano roll sooner or later. So for me, it was like always like a dream to be able to play synthesis like real oscillators with guitar or or with bass and we did that for a product with uh, Rabia Masad it's one of our artists he's an earnable artist as well good friend of ours and he also has like one of the same things that I have which is the Moog subsequent 37 and, and we really like it and we started talking with the team and I was just started pushing this this fresh beautiful minds that we have working with us right and like, what what are the biggest challenges technically to to do something like this? And we managed to do a synthesizer that detects the pitch of the guitar and uses the envelope of of the real audio signal to trigger to trigger the amplifier. So basically, the ADSR of it would would come from reading the envelope of the of the guitar, and then the pitch tr- triggers a real oscillator, rather a sawtooth uh, sine wave, triangle wave, or square wave. So you have an addit- add- additive thin after the pitch has been detected so it's not it's not that fast distortion filter that sounds like a synth but it, it's an actual synth but it, it's monophonic right that's the only limiting factor that you can't play open chords or more than one note at the same time but that is coming to to qc on these uh updates that we are doing now with plugin compatibility and we will deploy it in probably in the next one in the next update so that synth will be available for your friend probably in a month or a month and a half, hopefully. Don't quote me on that one, but we try to release them as soon as possible. But that's coming. That's It's a monophonic synth, but it's a real synth, which I'm, I'm really actually happy about. It's, it took us quite some time to do it. I'm sure he'll be happy to hear that. All right. What's the one thing that people don't know about Quad Cortex that you wish they did or they overlook? Vocals, actually. With the mini voicer and everything, it's a very capable uh, vocal processor as well. With the mini voice, you can have, you know, out of tune or, or, you know, somewhat a pitch correction and you can harmonize yourself and everything. You have compression, you have EQing. It can do a lot for, for vocals as well. And, and of course, it's, it's very powerful and, and it's not the cheapest unit out there, right? So, but if you are, you know, running to guitar as well, but you want to run vocals through it, you know, there's enough inputs and outputs and probably enough CPU for you to run a very, very good sounding. Uh, vocal chain as well. So yeah, I think that's something that we haven't seen many people do. You see, yeah, you, you that's definitely vocals. a big one because we also have two two inputs, two XLR or well, combo combo jack inputs that have phantom power, and 
uh, we thought about it in the beginning as well that like this could be used for vocals and we have seen some singer songwriters uh, using that input uh, for microphones or for some other instruments yeah that's definitely an overlooked uh, Peter okay last question then for both you guys thank you so much for your time by the way this is great I, I enjoyed speaking with you and learning more about what you do what's the best piece of advice that maybe you learned along the way or somebody imparted to you. Let's start with you, Doug. Okay, my mom told me this at a very, very critical point of my life. She said, never make decisions when you're upset and never make promises when you're happy. And it's probably the one piece of, I've gotten a lot of amazing advice throughout the years from incredible people, but I think that's the one that I find myself telling myself the most often and also telling friends about like the most often, right? So anytime someone is really upset, I don't know, it could be a personal issue where they're fighting with their girlfriends, like don't make it, you know, sleep on it, you know, take a couple of days, relax and then make a decision on it. So uh, yeah, that's probably the one. That's a good one. Francisco, how about you? This is a really tough question. I guess that... It would be like that d dreams come true, but with a lot of work. Like you need to stay committed to what you believe and give the best of yourself every day. Things happen, but you need to constantly move forward. If, if things seem too difficult and you just take a different path or a shortcut or things like this, just things don't happen the same way. If you stay committed to your goal, sooner or later, something will happen that will maybe derail you to a different place. And something will happen from that place that will kick off another start of something else that eventually will take you there. So it's, it's really important to stay on track and, you know, consistency and commitment are, are key for, for this to happen. I think that's a good, maybe piece. that would be a good piece of advice. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's good. It is a good one. Thanks for listening and being in my inner circle. Remember, if you have any questions or comments, you can send them to questions at bobbyosinski.com. You can also learn all about the latest in music, audio and production news, and find out about openings for my latest online classes at bobbyosinski.com. This is Bobby Osinski. I will see you next time.